Hello and welcome to the big seminar on theory of dispersing of inks. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at BIC. And welcome. Uh, today's presentation will feature uh, Mr. Andy Stumer, our business line manager for dispersion, um, where he'll go through um, concepts and theories uh, relating to ink. We are also, um, time permitting, we'll have some questions at the end. If you have any questions at all, please enter them in the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we'll get to them um, time permitting. If not, we'll, we'll follow up on to those questions after the fact. Also, um, we are recording this, and we'll send out the link to the recording as well as the presentation uh, to you tomorrow morning um, uh, with our follow-up. Uh, so with that, Andy, um, it's all yours, sir. Um, welcome and thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks and welcome everybody to our theory on dispersion of inks today. A uh, beautiful day in Maryland and I uh, hope uh, you everybody's having a good day. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, we're going to do a quick introduction, then we're going to dive right into the dispersion and milling process overview. Uh, we're going to discuss various lab equipment and production equipment capabilities here with the uh, VMA Gatesman line, uh, some uh, QC slides, and then at the end, we're going to finish it off with uh, discussion on our lab capabilities in Wallingsworth and in Germany. So the company uh, is a German company, VMA, uh, founded in 1972, almost 50 years ago by uh, this beautiful couple on the top uh, right there, Mr. And, uh, Herman and Elke Getzmann. They're both still around. Uh, Herman is still in the business. He visits the company a few times a week and uh, ensures that they still follow his design concept of modularity. Um, he's a really great guy. Uh, Bic has had a really strong relationship with EMA for almost 40 years now, and all of our facilities throughout the world use uh, VMA products exclusively. Um, in the U.S., we have had um, the uh, strategic relationship uh, since 1988. So we're the exclusive distributor of the product line and also uh, services done through the U.S. And we have a brand new lab that we opened up two years ago with the latest capabilities there as well to do trials and so on. The company is still in family hand. It's run by the two sons, Christian and Martin. And now over 100 employees all over the world, uh, uh, anywhere from Australia, US, Latin America, Europe, and the, uh, known for making high-end dissolvers, speed mills, as well as basket mills, for lab pilot and production. The first this format, as you can see right there, was uh, introduced in 1973. There are still a few customers, even in the U.S., that imported them back in the 70s. They're still running on the original motor. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, here is the company. The uh, building right there is uh, the new facility that was built two years ago. Um, new production capability. Uh, the company is known to be very flexible to various customers' requirements, so probably 40% of everything that VMA Getsman builds is custom. Uh, they have this complete solution for small lab scale, dispersers, milling equipment, all the way up to uh, manufacturing equipment. Uh, we have the state-of-the-art dispersion lab in the U.S. since two years, and, and in Germany we have one as well where we can do trials. Uh, so obviously, inks is an important market of ours, and uh, the dispersers, and milling equipment are used for various ink products uh, throughout the country. Um, so we differentiate between uh, different pigment classes. So we obviously have the organic pigments, we have inorganic pigments, we have some functional pigments, and then uh, the difficult to disperse specially baked pigments. Um, the idea is to really improve the gloss, transparency, pictorial strength, or color strength, as well as cleanliness of shade among the most important attributes that we want to really change when we go and, and do a proper dispersion of, of our formulations. Uh, so the dispersion process is really a breakup of our agglomerates. So these are pigment particles that are 
bond to, bonded together by these invisible forces. They're called Vanderbilt forces, and they're really packing our pigment in these clusters, these agglomerates. And the idea in the dispersion process is really simple. All we want to do is we want to break up these binding forces. We don't want to destroy our pigments. We just want to basically break them apart and separate those pigment particles and turn them uh, into aggregates. Or if uh, we want, we can go all the way down to primary particle size, which is the smallest individual particle of a pigment. So in order to do that, we need to employ different technologies we're going to cover. So the idea is of also of wetting off the solid particles and the mechanical breakdown of these agglomerates and aggregates into these primary particles. And then at the end, we're going to need some additives to keep these particles stabilized and in suspension. Um, so here you can see um, we can start out with a dissolver blade. We're going to do some deagglomeration. This is the first step in the dispersion process and wetting. And then the second process is going to go down to primary particle size. We really need to introduce the grinding, uh, with the milling with media. And then basically at the end, then we're going to stabilize our pigments with the use of additives. I know you're probably familiar, BIC has um, quite a variety of of different products that can help you get these particles stabilized in your formulations. So it's just a quick slide showing you different uh, uh, pigment particles, uh, the different in sizes. Uh, so it's quite a big variety right there. What's important to remember is this is when we look at the dispersion process, it's always two parts. So the first part really is uh, the deagglomeration stage, when we take a dissolver with a cow's blade, uh, and we really introduce a lot of shear forces, and we're trying to break up these binding forces. The problem with that is, is that the cow's blade does not have enough shear force to really go down to primary particle size. So the limitation, that kind of our experience is anywhere between 10 to 20 microns of particle size, uh, and then we get stuck. So if we want to get the aggregates down to the primary particle size, then we really need to look at the media milling part. So that's when we go down to primary particle size, so low micron range. And in some cases, you know, customers really want to go into the nano range. So with the right technology, we're perfectly capable of achieving that. And even to go down uh, sub 100 nanometers is, is not a problem anymore with, with today's technology. So from a dispersion process point of view, so we have two types of technologies that are important. So we have the pre-dispersion technology with the dissolver. So we have a whole line, we're gonna look at those. Uh, what's important there is to remember, there's a rule of thumb that tip speed should be between 18 to 25 meters per second. So that's the optimum window where I get most of my uh, dispersion uh, taking place. Um, then we go over to the fine dispersion, milling, grinding. If you want to go smaller, we need to be anywhere between 10 to 16 meters per second of tape speed, so it's a little slower. And for that, we use either our vertical bead mills uh, we have basket mills, which are really popular now, and also the horizontal bead mills, which probably you're familiar with as well. Uh, so we have a whole line there also we're going to cover. Uh, so what's important to look at is initially when I do my pre-dispersion in my mill base that I want to have always the correct ratio dissolver blade to my container diameter, so about one-third. And the graph on the right uh, shows you the differences in, in what would be the optimum dissolver blade ratio to my container ratio. So there is some play in there, depending obviously on the viscosity of the material, what am I trying to disperse, what type of ink product, uh, and then I can uh, make those changes as I, I see them fit to get the, the best possible pre-dispersion. And, and we want to always look at um, the tape speed, of course, which is the, one of the most important parameters in a dispersion process, which is between 18 to 25 meters per second. And, and there is a very simple calculation is um, 
that tip speed is multiplied by the RPMs, by the diameter of our blade, and then multiplied by uh, pi. And then if you want to do it in metric, divide the whole thing by 60, and that will give you the uh, meters per second of tip speed, which is really important to know when you're going to do your predispersion. So the visual cue that is uh, uh, always a dead giveaway if I look at my uh, mill days uh, is the donut effect. Uh, how does my product flow? What does it look like when I into my container when I'm applying the shear forces? Uh, if, if I have an optimized batch, I should see really the formation of a beautiful donut ring forming around my dissolver blade, and um, that's what I want to see. So that's what that looks like right here. And obviously, some for formulations, you know, you have to play with the viscosity. So if uh, you, you have very low viscosity, sometimes it's difficult to get a good forming donut. But if, if, you, if you're in the range anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 Santa points, you should have no problem getting a really nice donut. So the donut right there, um, and on this picture, you can see where all the shear forces are taking place is right on the edges, the corners of my cow's blade, where those two teeth are located, and that's where all of my separation uh, takes place, uh, breakup of these binding forces. So here you can see a really nicely prepared uh, a, a batch right there. Uh, we are putting in about 21 meters per second of tape speed, so it's optimized, and then we're putting in about 850 watts of energy, so it's a really, a uh, good looking batch right there. So in this case here, something went wrong. I'm not seeing that donut, it's splattering around. What, what happened? I'm having to maintain the same tip speed, but I'm not putting enough energy into my mill base. So I have to add more energy and just put more forces in uh, there to improve my donut and then that should cure that problem very quickly. Um, and here we actually have a situation where we have the same tip speed, but we put too much energy into the mill base, and therefore we don't see a donut effect at all. I have seen cases where people sometimes, you know, especially on very low viscous materials, have also a hard time getting a real donut, so it looks very similar to what you're seeing right there. One way of getting a better donut, uh, if you think you have all the right parameters in play, is to change, try to change the diameter of the disc. Either go maybe a little bit larger, usually that can cure the problem, and you should see a better donut appear and giving you a much better predispersion as a result of that. Um, so to optimize our dispersion results, we obviously, the amount of time we spend doing the predispersion, so that, that the rule of thumb there is, for most applications between 15 to 30 minutes, uh, that should be sufficient before we go with the medium milling. Once we see, ideally, the donut effect, um, the tape speed, again, write that down if you can, or we send up you the presentation. That's a really important number, is that 18 to 25. Um, the diameter of my blade is really important, um, and then, the type of IntelliDisc, so there's different variations on the market also, whatever the space for the bottom. Um, there is also, obviously, the amount of mill base that plays a critical role. Uh, if I, you know, have too much product, I'm gonna spill it, it's gonna come out of my container. If I don't have enough product, then I can't really oscillate my blade and move it into the sweet spot. So I'm really uh, gonna be limited in the amount of uh, you know, a, a dispersion parameter input right there. Uh, pigment and filler concentration, obviously, we want to keep the temperature as low as possible. And pre-dispersion, that's not so critical because we're really not putting in so much shear that the temperature goes out of range, really. We see it more when we do media milling. We cover that also. And then uh, additives are important. We, we all know that uh, that plays a huge part in the quality of our dispersion so that we don't have flocculation at the end, other uh, defomers and so on that help us get a better product. 
um, and also transfer the product easier if we use the right uh, additives. And then we want to move over to a heat mill, uh, which then allows us to add more energy. So the dissolver, you know, is limited in terms of shear force. Um, we only deagglomerate really. We do not go down to the primary particle size. Uh, it's important that we do the deagglomeration first with the dissolver. We cannot just go into a medium mill. Uh, the problem is that usually you see is you would be clogging up a screen or a dynamic gap uh, distance. Uh, you know, would eventually just uh, your larger particles just cover that, and then you wouldn't have any movement of your product through the milling chamber, uh, or a basket mill for that matter. Um, and then uh, color strength is limited. If I'm only using a dissolver, my gloss won't be as nice. You know, pink strength and those parameters will suffer if I stop after just using a dissolver. Then with the bead mill, I'm going down to my primary particle size. I do the further uh, deagglomeration of my, of my pigments down to nanometers. Uh, and then I'm improving all my product characteristics a lot in terms of particle size, my, my color strength, uh, transparency, particle attribution, you name it. Um, all these uh, will be dramatically improved by, by, by going with the medium mail. So in a medium mail, it's important to understand what is actually happening right there. So it's not that I'm crushing and destroying my pigment as these beads collide. These beads do collide, but because of the fluid dynamic that's going on inside of my container, these beads drift towards each other at very high shear forces, and, and, and basically some of them hit, but the pigment particles themselves it's very low probability for them actually getting crushed in between two beads to get pushed out of the way. And that whole motion that's happening at uh, these high speeds, these speeds fly, flying around the pigments, that's what's really causing that shear stress to, that breaks up these binding forces and further uh, reduces our particles down to the nano range of, of, of primary particle range. Uh, and then also this also does the wetting and stabilizing of my product. Uh, and then it's the true breakdown through the primary particle size, uh, not the uh, first step with the dissolver. Uh, so you really need to do that as well. Uh, so it's important there to look at the type of beads that you're using. Uh, I see customers sometimes um, that use really inexpensive glass beads. I've seen sort of people using steel beads. Uh, I wouldn't recommend any of those. I would use high quality zirconia beads, either Siconium stabilized or yttrium treated, depending on what type of product you're trying to disperse. And that they will last a lot longer, they will wear much more evenly, and you uh, won't have any shards or, you know, fall off in, in, in your mill base, which is problematic, especially when you're using glass and you're not really getting a really good quality dispersion. Uh, as you would if you would use a higher quality bead. So I highly recommend spend a little bit more money and also look at the uh, kinetic energy. The weight is really important of the bead. So the zirconia beads are much heavier uh, serum stabilized or yttrium than a glass bead, for example. So you have a lot more force hitting your, your pigment particles uh, than you would get with glass. Imagine um, you try to crack a walnut and you have a very small hammer, you know, that you use it to, to fix a watch, uh, you would maybe need, you know, a whole day just to crack the walnut, or you may never be able to because you just don't have the force, the kinetic force to break it up with a small hammer. So with a sledgehammer, all it would take me one blow and I break it up. Uh, the same idea applies to milling. So specific uh, weight is really critical. Uh, in my process, so always look at that and make sure that you have uh, higher standards when you make your uh, ink dispersions, okay? So here you can see in the slide uh, where the actual shear forces and separation uh, is taking place. Uh, so that's actually right here in these, these corners right there as these beads uh, collide the, the, in the, in the uh, corner right between the two beads. That's actually where my shear stress uh, is the highest, and that's where the separation occurs uh, of my binding forces, okay? So these are some of the critical parameters that influence the dissolving process. So obviously, particle size after the predispersion, we wanna, don't wanna be 
higher than 20 to 30 microns, the smaller the better. Uh, my bead size, the kinetic energy, what we talked about, so the specific weights of the beads are very important. The volume of the beads uh, should always be uh, big, high enough that I can do my proper dispersion. So in a pop mill, I need higher bead loading than the basket mill. So depending on the type of mill that I'm using, there's always a, a good ratio uh, that uh, you, you should use in terms of bead load. Uh, the speed of the milling tool, very critical, 10 to 16 meters per second. Temperature here is very important that you control that because in milling, um, this is where most of the energy is being created. And if you don't have a double ball isolated milling chamber that allows you to cool, um, your temperature will go up very rapidly and, and it will affect the quality of your product, um, even ruin the product uh, if you don't cool properly. Uh, the number of passes, obviously, how often does it cycle through my milling chamber or basket mill plays a critical role there. The milling time, resident time inside of my milling chamber. Um, obviously, very important. And then the viscosity of my mill base. If it's very thin, uh, most ink products, you know, we don't have a problem with viscosity really milling it, but we uh, sometimes run into situations where it's very, very thin. So then it's, it's not stable enough to really run through a horizontal mill. So maybe a basket mill would be the better option there. Or if the viscosity is too high, we're not able to really use a basket mill or an immersion mill because it just doesn't circulate through the milling chamber or the basket mill properly. It gets stuck in there. Uh, also, with fixotropic uh, products, sometimes uh, we have seen it's an issue uh, with the basket mill. Uh, so uh, certain additives can address it, but uh, that's something that's important to look at. How does my product really flow? And that will also dictate the type of feed mill that I need to use for my end processes. Okay, so here's just a quick slide on the production environment. Uh, fantastic uh, facility uh, for ink dispersions. They use basket milling in combination with rubber dissolvers. Um, very, very nice facility. So, but in the laboratory, uh, we want to look at a, a standard dissolver, you know, needs to have really high RPMs to really get us the amount of tip speed we need. Uh, ideally, uh, if we're dealing with a lot of solvent-based products, I might want to look at an EX model, which is not always the best way to go, especially by the snorkel or at the hood. It's a lot easier to install a non-EX model than an EX model. And um, the uh, control capability on a non-EX model is a lot more user-friendly, I would say, in front of the machine and if you use an EX model. Uh, so there's different versions available. So you have an entry level model and then high end with different software capabilities depending on what you want. But the most important part is really that the, the, the this is an ideal solution because it offers also the milling part, not only the dissolver. So you can swap out uh, this uh, dissolver blade and turn this into either a deep mill or a basket mill or rotor stator very quickly. Uh, so that's one of some of the advantages by having a dispermat. It, 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 it's, it's allowing you to be a universal tool by changing the different attachments very rapidly and turning a homogenized and multiple disperser depending on what type of product you run. So that's what it look like. Uh, so the different attachments on one machine is very unique to the VMA design philosophy, making it a very uh, spe special product for all your laboratory ink dispersion uh, needs. So the uh, smallest member of our family, we call it the LC line. Uh, so it's very simple, it's got a speed dial and it's got a timer function. But if you wanna do temperature readout, look at your torque, those kind of things, uh, it's not really designed for that, so it's a very simple standalone uh, dissolver for the lab. Doesn't cost a lot of money. It's, it's, it's very quiet. We use uh, step motors. You can hardly hear them when they run, even at high speeds. So that's a, a, a very um, nice machine for for small lab applications. Somebody who says, you know, I want a little bit more features. I like to add temperature measurement. I want to see more torque because that tells me something about my viscosity changes as I'm doing my dispersing. I can look at a CD line, and there also 
have the ability to attach a basket mill on there or a bead mill. So this is a fully functioning dissolver slash milling system for the lab um, and also very quiet as well. And then you'll have a temperature capability hookup uh, with a PT100 Pro. Uh, Benchtop model, uh, very nice with the full safety features. So the clamping system, we also have a what we call the working area safety system. So you're actually setting the threshold of the impeller blade inside of your container at a certain height. What that means is if somebody were to inadvertently lift up the dissolver blade or shaft while the machine is running, it would automatically power down once it crosses that point. So that, that way nobody uh, gets hurt by a 20,000 RPM spinning cow's blade and gets cut into pieces or you don't have a uh, product flying uh, through your lab. So that's uh, some of the important safety features of the system at line. So then a very popular model, especially for the ink customers also is the CN line. Uh, it's a little bigger. Uh, we go all the way up to uh, 100 liters of product with this machine. So it works well as a pilot scale uh, unit as well. So there's different motor sizes and stand sizes. Also very quiet and similar to the CD in terms of capabilities. Uh, with what there, but also here I have the automatic um, threshold setting right here uh, where I can set the upper and lower limit in my containers for how I can safely operate the dissolver. So, so if somebody were to lift it up, it would then automatically power down just like on the CD line. And again, fully modular, expandable to any of these attachments that we just discussed. Uh, and then here is a larger CN, same capability, which is going more for pilot scale. And then we have our premium line, which is the AE line, which is really nice because it gives you full-blown control capability for being very reproducible between batches. Uh, it allows you to not only uh, store the batches by name or product number, but you can also send all the data over to a computer and watch the dispersion process in real time on a graphical interface, and you can program cutout values. Let's say you make a certain ink dispersion or product that you, you, it's very temperature sensitive, so you could program it so that it would maintain a certain temperature, or if it goes above a certain temperature point, it would automatically reduce the RPMs or reduce the amount of energy you're putting in. That's the other thing with the AE line. Instead of just running at a certain amount of speed, uh, I can run this with what's, constant, what's called constant power. So I can set it up to say 500 watts of energy for 30 minutes for my milling process, and then the machine will automatically adjust the speed depending on how much energy uh, I'm, I'm trying to put into my formulation. So it would either increase the speed or decrease the speed depending on the viscosity changes of my material because I'm always maintaining a certain amount of energy that I'm putting into my mill base. That now allows me to really precisely calculate uh, my upscale cost and my manufacturing cost because I would know exactly how much money does it cost me to produce a batch of product uh, for a certain amount of time with that amount of energy. So it's a beautiful uh, system, perfect for the lab uh, uh, and up for, for where somebody says, I really need something to give me the best possible upscale capability on the market. Then the AE line is the best uh, that you'll be able to find. Uh, again, fully modular and also explosion-proof models are available um, in, that, uh, in that design as well. Okay, so larger AE model here for upscale, uh, uh, up to about 31 gallons in mill base, maximum 100 liters uh, of, of, of on the largest uh, pilot scale. We also uh, show, I'll show you some production scale uh, dispersing units as well uh, that we, we have for, for the uh, increment market. So here is our horizontal design. So we have a brand new that came out this year uh, of our new SL line. The SL on the left is the lab scale, beautiful machine, also full seat technology, uh, allows you to store everything uh, in terms of a uh, batch number or name. Um, it has a nano kit available. So if somebody says, you know what, I want a machine that I can do my milling, but on some products, you know, my carbon blacks, I really want to go down, make this person, I want to go down to sub 100 nanometers. Then DSL is a great tool because I have to just add, add on 
the nano kit, and now I'm in milling in the nano range. And the same thing for the RS, which is the production scale. So I brand new also this year in, in various sizes um, that we offer, uh, either in ceramic or non-ceramic or silicon carbide, depending on what you're trying to process. There's a lot of different configurations uh, that we offer, not only on the larger one, but also on the smaller one as well. Um, especially if somebody wants to do a lot of white products, CO2 you know, milling. So therefore, uh, we need to have a milling chamber ceramic rotor, ideally to uh, avoid any type of discoloration of main products. Um, that's what that's for. Uh, then we have the large scale dissolvers. So we can go up to 2,000 liters um, of product volume, uh, beautiful machines. These machines are also fully modular. So what that means is I'm not only putting a dissolver in my plant, I'm also using the same machine to do my milling. So now I can save a lot of space because I don't need to clean two machines. I clean one machine, I'm dispersing on one machine, and I'm milling on one machine. I don't have to move the containers around. So that's a huge advantage uh, the industry um, that, that, that VMA here brings to the table. So this is what that looks like. We have what's called the new QCS system. It's a quick change system uh, that allows you to just quickly move a basket mill onto the same dissolver, okay? So it's very rapid change, takes you less than two minutes to make a color change. So a lot of customers now say, you know what? I'm running 10 different colors a week. What can I do to minimize my cleaning time? Okay, so what I would say, why don't you look at buying a two or three different baskets or one for each of your color families, and then you don't have any idle time on the machine because all you have to do is really go there, change the basket, put on a new basket, and now you're running and making a whole new product without having the machine sit there idle, um, uh, waiting it for it to be clean. So that's a huge improvement in, uh, in, in terms of production uh, design capability. So that's how that's done. So you have a stand, and that stand basically just basically gets carted back and forth between wherever you're storing your basket mill and the dissolver blade, and you just put the dissolver blade right up to it and then uh, make that change over. It takes you less than uh, two minutes to do that. Um, then we also have vacuum capabilities. Some customers have a lot of foaming issues. Uh, so with the vacuum, I can remove that foam. I have a better wetting and dispersing effect. I can also put in more energy, especially when I'm milling. Imagine like these tiny air bubbles, they're almost like little air mattresses that sit around the pigment particles, they act as buffers. So if I'm removing all that, what happens is I'm much more efficient in my energy input, okay? So that means I'm doing a faster milling, I'm eliminating the foam. Uh, I also have a much faster product transfer because that's one of the issues that people are having is when I'm completed with my batch, what I'm, it's going to foam up when I try to move it from container A to container B. If I'm removing all the air, now I have a much more efficient product transfer. So that's a big uh, advantage, obviously cost savings, uh, and then uh, there is variable vacuum pumps depending on how much vacuum pressure you want and what type of capabilities. And then with not main links, but some customers like to have a nitrogen purging valve and inert gas just to keep the products dry and free of moisture. Uh, and then uh, this is really a very, very cool design. It's called the new Distromat TM. It's a two-in-one design. So that already has a basket mill integrated into the dissolver. So with the push of a button, I can do the dissolving or I can do milling. So it's, uh, it's very simple. So you have your container with your premix, you pull it right under the machine, then you lower the dissolver blade, you do your pre-dispersion for 15 to 20, 30 minutes, and then you push the button and the basket mill gets lowered right into the, the, the mill base and the, the container cover sits uh, on top and then uh, you can, you're ready to do the milling without ever having to move your, uh, your, your container around. Okay, so it's two in one. It's excellent. It's for customers uh, that uh, want to have uh, a, a very rapid uh, dispersions and uh, 
don't want to mess around with a lot of cleaning. If, if you have a lot of different colors, then I would probably recommend the one that I showed you before with the multiple baskets. It's a little bit more challenging on this model to change out the baskets. So if you have a dedicated color that you're running all the time, uh, then I would say that this is a really good way to go. But if you want to use one machine for many different colors, I would prefer you get the SC model with the multiple baskets. Okay, other than that, this is a really, really great um, system uh, for your facility. Okay, so that's what the two TMs look like in a production environment. Uh, the cows plate have not been installed yet. Uh, they are like back there in the corner. You go right on here and here you see the baskets right here. So the two-in-one system is really an awesome type of system for your production area. Uh, so how does the basket mill design look? What does it look like? So our competitors, they usually have screens on the side right there. Our, ours is fully closed. The reason for that is because we believe that cooling is the most important part in the milling process. Therefore, what we did was we designed our mills with the, with the screen on the bottom, and below that we have a towel blade with the purpose of actually drawing our ink or the dispersion out of the basket through the screen and then basically uh, force it back around the container to the top where then it gets sucked back in. We have a uh, patented vortex wheel that basically, uh, it's, like a, it's like a tornado, it just draws the, 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 the formulation and mill base right into the basket. So you have a very nice circulation of your mill base and that's a really, really important um, a part of, of, of using basket mill. So here you can see the uh, uh, vortex plate on top and then the cow plate on the bottom separated by the milling disc and the screen. And then right here in the walls of the container, you can see the cooling line. So we are also cooling the, the, the side wall and on the larger machines, we are also cooling the entire top as well. So, uh, here's just a slide. So we have the small TML all the way to the large ones. So if you get a small lab scale disperser with the basket mill, you have upscale capability of one to one to manufacturing, which is also really nice with the VMA product line. Okay. So this is the large scale um, basket mill. So here we are filling the beads in, 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 in right here. And uh, we are not only cooling the chamber, the side of our milling wall, but also the top. So we have proper cooling of my own mill base. And then uh, back here, so this water is water in. Over here is water or coolant out. And back here we have a temperature sensor measurement. We are also measuring the mill base temperature inside of our milling chamber and not outside like a lot of people do. So that's also important because I don't know how hot does it really get inside of my mill because that's what would hurt my product. And with this design, we're able to do that. Okay. Uh, then some customers say, you know what? I really don't want to use a, uh, a, a basket mill. I want to use a horizontal mill. We've been always using horizontal mills. Uh, we need to go sub 100 nanometers. Then I would say, well, probably you want to use a horizontal mill because the limitations Go back to uh, with one of these, it's obviously a batch system, so I can't do um, a pass through uh, endless amounts of product. Uh, that's one of the, the drawbacks. And the other drawback is really the limitation in terms of particle size. So if I'm doing carbon blacks and I need to go down to sub 100 nanometers, then this is maybe not the best design. Uh, I can go maybe to four or 500 nanometers, but not lower. Um, so for, if, if you're telling me I need something to mill really down below 500 nanometers, then we, we won't be going around a horizontal mill. But the, if you can use horizontal, a uh, 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 like a, 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 a basket mill, what I showed you, it's much easier to clean, okay? So there is no rubber seals, O-rings, and that kind of things. These wear items are not there. So it's a much better product just to keep uh, clean and easier to do color change than with one of these. So a lot of people actually moving away from the traditional horizontal mills, if the particle size distribution and the particle size allows them to do it and go with the uh, basket mill design that I showed you before, just because of the way ease of use and the efficiency, okay? Uh, then we have what's called an APS system. 
uh, really well liked with a lot of smaller uh, in ink labs. They like this because it's a, like a pot mill. It fits also to our small laboratory scale dissolvers. And basically I have two containers with that system. I have uh, my top container where I do my dis pre-dispersing and my milling. And then I have a drain plug right here um, that I open up when I'm done with my milling. And I hook up an airline to my lid. Uh, so this is a fully enclosed system. And then I basically purge out my mill base, my ink through the screen right here into my container below. Uh, and that way I'm, I'm done uh, processing, milling and dispersing all in one machine very quickly, but also very easy to clean up. Uh, the problem with this system is, uh, is that it's not really designed for large manufacturing uh, scale uh, application. It's really more only for lab. Uh, we have one customer who does on a custom design like this, he goes up to about 20 gallons of material, but that's about the most in terms of volume that you can do with this type of system. You know, if you want to do something super large or upscale, then that's not uh, what I would recommend. It's kind of perfect for the lab to seeing something or developing a lot of products very fast, this is great, or the smaller basket mill also. Um, the, one of the advantages there is if I'm over a basket mill, is that if my viscosity of my material is too high, uh, I will have an issue uh, with the basket mill pumping it through my uh, milling chamber, uh, cycling it through. So this is a lot easier to handle if I have high viscosities or thixotropic materials that don't flow properly in, in my container. So how do we check the quality? Uh, so obviously we need to different control capabilities. So um, over here on the left, you have our new C control panel that allows you to store all the data uh, and also not only run by a, a certain speed, but by with constant power. I, I'll have a, a torque reading right there that's uh, measured through my energy input with the frequency converter. I have my tip speed display, what I showed you the calculation earlier, so you can actually see right here. I also have um, a temperature reader and a timer function, and then a complete uh, PC capability. Uh, I also have um, explosion model, not as intricate, but I can do everything on a computer that I can do uh, what I could do over here with just a regular control panel. And some customers say, you know what, SPC, I want to do my own uh, integration. So that's also an option to our production scale machines where that allows you to optimize your process the way you see it fit. Um, so then obviously I want to be able to control my parameters so I can uh, just give products a name, uh, put in all my different critical dispersion parameters, store the data, and next time when I'm running it, I'm able to recall uh, the that, that batch or, or, or a product number and it's going to replicate everything the same way again, even to the point where the blade height in my container will always be positioned at exactly the same place. Because that's also important in my uh, dispersion process for being really reproducible and repeatable. Uh, I have the ability to, to program these cutout values. That's important. Uh, so it's protecting my product or my equipment, if anything were to go wrong, or the temperature, or all of a sudden my torque would go out of line. Uh, I know that something is off with my viscosity, so I could either change the amount of energy I'm putting in, or reduce my speed, or, or even go up in speed, depending on the formulation. Uh, so I have a lot of parameters that I can play with uh, in store, and, and that allows me to really deal with control my dispersion process. So then I also have the ability to monitor uh, to the electrical interface, not only on my display, but also a remote on a PC. And there is upwards to come where I'm able to do everything device. And even if I'm not in the lab, what's going on, I'm able to send your data to your phone at um, what you want to do. Okay, uh, we can also do something for net power power with higher end units. So the machine uh, so the net power basically at an absolute zero point for all energy that is being used to operate my motor, uh, my shaft, my dissolver, 
my mailing for the machine will run for for about thirty minutes, and then back is um, that it's using to operate itself, so that I know all the values that I'm seeing pertain to my product formulation, not the machine um, as it's uh, trying to power itself uh, during the dispersion process. Okay, so we can uh, do that. That's really good for up here. Uh, my net power that I'm using for my formulation. Okay, uh, version of the wind is just working right now in Houston, so that's the uh, a process uh, control window on my PC and uh, run it from there um, or on the machine. But uh, this is the right uh, in process to be completely redone and give you a completely new interface. To match the new C technology package that I showed before. So, can't show it to you yet because uh, it's uh, still working for us. Uh, we have some outstanding capabilities in Germany. We basically want to do trials um, and send it up there. You're more than welcome. Well, in Wallingford, we have also excellent capabilities. We are just adding new products. What's great up there is in, uh, in conjunction with our sister company, the big analytics team, who are all ink specialists. Uh, we have them working with us alongside trying to on a lot of options on how to modify formulation or optimize the process. So we have a lot of that capability. So don't look at big or VMA, the Distomat brand is just somebody that wants to sell it. No, we go far beyond that. We are solution providers, not only from a technical point of view on the equipment, but also how can we help you make a better product. So that's what we do. We do that um, in our lab in Wallingford or, or Germany, depending on, 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 on where you're located. It's your global, so we have all these capabilities. These are the brand new machines. They're actually on route right now. Uh, they should arrive there within the next week or two, and uh, they all have the new C technology uh, already integrated with all the different um, milling tools, attachments that we previously discussed, all the capabilities there. So if you have anything you want to run or interested in upgrading um, or upscale uh, discussion, give me a call, talk to our team, and we'll be able to uh, schedule something. Uh, with or without you, depending on what the COVID uh, restrictions allow. At the moment, nobody is allowed in the lab uh, on the, uh, except us, obviously, and we, you can send material in and we can video conference in. It works really well. Uh, we have that capability. Okay, so just a first class lab facility uh, up there. We have all the different milling techniques and dispersing um, uh, capabilities. Very good for upscale. And then Again, with our editors team, we can really help customers uh, with their formulation questions. And uh, if you ever want to do a seminar or you have clients you want to come up there with a great facility, we talk to us, we can set that up for you as well. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, opening up to questions. Thank you, Andy. Um, good stuff, a lot of stuff. Um, thanks everyone for hanging in there. Um, you will get a copy of the recording as well as the presentation materials um, tomorrow morning um, for uh, review or for sharing with peers or uh, for any other follow-up questions you may have. Um, so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, we have a little bit of time left, um, please enter them in the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and uh, we'll get to them. Um, Andy, and you know, just a, a question um, that I have. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, ability to scale up and the modularity of, of the systems? Because that, that's, you know, I, I think one of the key benefits to, to what VMA offers. Right. Um, good question. So basically, as you have seen before, you know, we have very small laboratory solvers. Uh, that allow you to add a basket mill on there or a top mill, uh, but for uh, or even a small horizontal mill. So by going with our design concept to offering same styling of basket mill for our manufacturing grade uh, machines, and our, our, with our C technology, we were really able to do a one-to-one 
to one upscale from lab to pilot to manufacturing. Uh, we have done that many times in the lab and shown our customers. It's really uh, amazing how that works. You know, there are some key parameters that we obviously have to keep in mind. Obviously, the amount of energy we are putting in, that the uh, ratio, the plate diameter to my container vessel, um, the temperature, the mill base. So these are some of the important factors but that I have put in place. I should be able to get really good upscaling data uh, with our equipment and, and, and upscaling confidence. Uh, that's the most important thing. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we have a question in here from Danielle. Um, she says, you showed examples of the correct tip speed with too much or too little energy input. How would you change the energy without changing the tip speed slash RPMs? So it's basically the amount of force, it's the motor power that you're putting in. You know, I can spin something with two RPMs very lightly, or I can use a lot of force to spin something at two RPMs. It's how much energy I'm using to move an object. Basically, that's the amount of energy that you're using to operate something. So it's all okay. about torque and power. Great. Uh, Danielle, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, did that answer your question? Are you, are you there? Yes, that did. Thank you. Yes. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Danielle. Good question. Yes, definitely. Um, let's see, we, well, uh, some other questions are coming in here, but before they, they get in all the way here, um, can you talk a bit about the innovation, um, things that are you know, on the horizon or, or coming in the near um, future? Well, you know, we actually the last, I would say the last two years were really pivotal for VMA uh, in terms of new product introduction. Uh, the TM, uh, uh, what we came out with, the two and one system uh, for manufacturing is a real game changer in the industry. And we have seen it with customers using them. Uh, they are like, this is just a totally different level of, 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 of manufacturing, of, of production uh, scale, uh, of dispersing and milling. Um, having a system uh, where I'm able to do dispersing and milling on the same unit, it's just, a, it's just a huge cost benefit to the customer, you know, in terms of time yeah. savings, cleanup time, uh, as well as maintenance, you know. And then obviously you look at the space savings. I have one machine that can do everything instead of having multiple machines throughout my facility, okay? So mm -hmm. when I go into some of these older manufacturing facilities. I see they have a room filled with dispersers, and then they move over to a room with milling equipment. Okay, now I can slash that in half, because they can do everything in one area on one machine, uh, with just using multiple baskets, so if in the TML M for dedicated products, I just run that um, with one, one basket. So everybody, you know, should have the vision what that would look like in your own facility and how much you can save in terms of, of operating costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question about the seat technology package, and that that's a control interface, correct, in the software? Yeah, yes. Can so you, the seat the C technology you expand on that? basically Yeah. So the seat technology is basically the package that allows you to really put in all and monitor all the critical dispersion and milling processing parameters on the screen. So there is a very inexpensive way of doing it. All I need, like some of the, in the old days, I, all I needed was a speed and a timer, or maybe not, they didn't even need a timer function because I was able to time it myself. Well, you know, we're 2021, a lot of people want to have more capability. So with the C technology, I can see my tape speed on, on screen. I can see exactly how much energy I'm putting in. I can monitor my viscosity change from my torque reading. I have a timer function. I can program cutoff values. I can store products by individual names. You know, I can say, I can set a certain impeller height for one particular product with a certain volume of product, and next time I'm running it, I'm able to mimic and reproduce exactly the same product every yeah. single time. 
So it takes out the C technology really helps me make a more consistent and stable product uh, over and over again. And, and, and it doesn't leave anything to change. So process yeah. variability is cut down to a bare minimum. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. Are there, um, we don't have any other questions in here right now. Um, so if, if someone out there has, has some questions, please uh, log them in the Q&A box or in the chat box and uh, we'll get them answered. We have just five minutes left. Um, Andy, are there specific questions or, or frequently asked questions that you get when someone's evaluating, um, you know, sure. putting in a pilot line? Yeah, not all pilot. I've been yeah. a lot of late lately, you know, since we really started uh, offering this uh, production capability the last two, two, three years in the U.S. It's been found in Europe for much longer. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, some of the question is maintenance and service. So all that is done through the U.S. So Big and Altana are 100% behind it. We have an excellent service here. And it's out of our headquarters here in Columbia, Maryland, and when we cover all of the U.S. and Canada. So um, no problem from that point of view. Um, so that's really a very common uh, question or concern that customers have. Okay. Great. Great. Um, that, that may be it. In terms of questions, um, well, one more thing is also uh, John, sure. uh, about costing. You know, people see this ah. uh, and they go back and say, "Well, I, I'm afraid to ask how much would that cost me to buy such <laughs> yeah. a system." And the, and the truth of it is, it's not that it's not more at all than our competitors. So if you look at a mixer, right? We don't make mixers. So some people just buy mixing equipment and say, "Oh, I bought a large scale mixer." And I bought this for, you know, $40,000, it's halfway decent quality. That's not a disperser. So if you want to go and buy an explosion-proof dissolver for your facility in large scale, you're looking probably around $100,000 to $150,000. So that's the same range that we are in. But here you mm -hmm. also get up at the basket. Now, so if I do the math and say, and, and uh, some of the other equipment out there, I need to buy, let's say, a dissolver, and I need another basket mill. So now I need two pieces of equipment, $1,000 very quickly, whereas I can tell yeah. you the same solution maybe between 150 to 200000 So actually, it's a, it's a, we're saving customers money, not only in operating costs, but also the acquisition is much more financially advantageous. And on top of that, we leave to own where customers, uh, we started that during COVID, can buy piece of cap equipment and have the ability to not uh, buy, but also lease it and own it after the term of the two or three years, depending on how, how you want to structure it. So that's another huge benefit that we offer. Yeah, definitely. It's a lot of options there. Good, good. So, and we with do that, that for the um, as well. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So with that, we'll um, conclude today's presentation. Um, take note, we will uh, send you the presentation along with uh, a link to this recording um, so you can listen to it and um, feel free to respond to the email. Uh, if you have any questions or not, uh, or any questions about anything, um, there we go. And uh, we'll, we'll get back with you and get, get any of those questions answered or um, help you in any way we can. Uh, so with that, have a great rest of your day, and thanks for joining us, and be on the lookout for future uh, BIC uh, web seminars and presentations. Thank you. Thanks again, Andy. Good job. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your day.